Thanks for clicking in. We upload new videos every week, so go ahead and subscribe for some encouragement. You also may feel led to sow into the ministry, and we have several different ways to do so. Your giving goes towards our outreaches we do all year round. Now, let's listen in. I have this bad habit of when I'm moving around, leaving the TV on. And what the TV does to me sometimes is it, it causes me to, to get caught up in what's playing. And, and I have good intentions. I'm just letting it play and I'm moving around. And uh, sometimes something will catch my eye that just makes me kind of, you know, I start staring at it a little too long as I'm walking. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm by the refrigerator just kind of standing still for a minute. And, and then I'll end up on the couch just chilling and, and watching whatever's playing. And I like those kind of shows that you see on the History Channel or National Geographic. Those are the ones that get me. If it's a movie I can watch later, I'll watch it later. But it's those, those shows that they may not come on later, so I, they, they get me caught up. And it's often those shows that, that show people doing daring things. I like that stuff. I like stuff that is risky. I like stuff where people like really, really literally lay their lives on the line for something that they want to get done. And, and I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but that's what being a Christian is and living a life of risk. That's what faith is. Faith is nothing but risk. And every time God gives you something or shows you something, you're laying it all on the line to make it happen. Because nothing that God ever shows you will ever come easy. So I was watching this show a couple weeks ago on uh, Mount Everest. And I long to not climb Mount Everest. I just want to get a cool picture for Instagram in front of it one day. <laughs> I, I'm not built for that life, but it would be really cool to have a picture with that in the background. But, uh, but I, I love the story of Mount Everest. I've read leadership books on Mount Everest and, and building the team required to, to climb something like Mount Everest. And, and this documentary was going through all the people that have successfully climbed Mount Everest. And it started with Edmund Hillary. That is, they call him the first man to ever get to the peak of Mount Everest. But actually, he was not the first one to do it. There was his tour guide, and I, I don't want to say his name wrong, but his name was Tenzing Norgay. And in order to be the tour guide, that means you had to have done it before. Nobody just wants to hire somebody to just hang with them as they put their life on the line. If you bring in a tour guide, you want somebody that knows the land, knows the conditions, knows the danger. And, and they say that this guy climbed it multiple times before Edmund Hillary ever did it. And after this, and that's not really what impressed me, but afterwards, he began to live the rest of his days taking people all the way to the top of the mountain. And when asked, why do you do this over and over and over? Because so many people have lost their lives climbing to the top of Mount Everest. It's hard to climb a mountain. You can't prepare for what you're going to experience climbing a mountain. The conditions change rapidly climbing a mountain. And, and much like faith, you must understand that once you live a life of faith, you cannot predict the conditions that are going to come at you. Because once you decide to live a life of faith, the devil, like Job, is going to throw everything at you to get you to break. Yeah. So the conditions living a life of faith are going to rapidly change. As the song said, this is why you have to have the mentality that says, I'm not backing down from no giant. Because if, if the conditions are going to change, then I'm prepared for them to change so it doesn't shock me when it happens. Every day I get out of bed, I expect something bad to happen. If I expect something bad to happen, then when it doesn't happen, I have a reason to praise God. <laughs> 
But I expect, I do expect good things to happen. Give us this day our daily bread. I expect daily bread every day I get out of bed. But I also expect to be attacked because if, if the devil is scared of me, why would he leave me alone? To every person that says, I never get attacked. My life is amazing. Well, you're scared because you're probably the, you scared me because you're probably the one attacking other people. But also it shows me that you're not living a life that the devil is afraid of. Tony Evans in his book, Kingdom Men, he said, every day you get out of bed, your life should be the kind of life that makes the devil say, oh crap, they awoke. Living a life of faith like climbing a mountain, you, you must expect conditions to change on your job, with your money, with your health, with your family. The conditions change. The weather changes when you climb a mountain. It may be 80 degrees in the valley, but at the top of the mountain, you're freezing. Because as you go higher, the requirements change. So as you go higher with God, you have to expect for what it felt like down here to not feel like that up there. The conditions change. The weather changes. Oxygen gets tighter the higher you go. It gets harder to breathe sometimes. There are people in here that know from experience when life begins to come at you and the devil is hitting you, sometimes it literally feels like he's choking you. So the tour guide has to be qualified to take people to the top. And they asked him, why do you do this? And he looked at the person that asked him and said, have you ever climbed to the top and looked out? Once you get to the top, it becomes addictive to climb mountains. Most people don't know about the addiction of climbing a mountain that God gives you because you've never tried to climb one. And once you really climb a mountain for God, it's not just addictive for you to do it by yourself. You want to show as many people as possible what the view looks like from the top. Yeah. That, that's what church is supposed to do. It's supposed to teach you, as Ephesians says, how to look at life with a heavenly view. How to look down on your problems instead of looking straight ahead. Because a heavenly view allows everything that comes at you to make sense. But looking at things straight ahead causes everything that comes at you to look like the end. It is climbing the mountains. And the reason he went time after time after time is because there's nothing like the feeling of climbing a mountain. Climbing a mountain that God gives you is better than drugs. It's better than sex. It's better than having a companion. It's better than having money. But most people say, I don't know. That's because you've never done it. And today, if I accomplish my mission, you will throw your life at not only finding your mountain, but climbing your mountain. Jesus said it like this in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. He says, for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt his heart, but believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he says, he says, therefore, I say, whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Amen. He says, if you believe what you say, when you speak to a mountain, it'll move. Do you know that your mountain knows your voice? Yes. Do you know that the mountain that God has for you? knows your unique voice pattern 
It will not move for my voice pattern. It will not move for somebody else's voice pattern. Your mountain knows your voice. I know it's mine because I have the courage to speak to it. What mountain do you have the courage to speak to? Maybe the mountains concerning your marriage. Maybe the mountains concerning a marriage. Maybe the mountains concerning your singleness. Maybe the mountains concerning a sickness or a healing. Maybe the mountains concerning money. But I wonder today how many people have the courage to speak to your mountain. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how scary it is. I don't care how intimidating it is. I don't care how unlikely it is for somebody like you to have a promise that big, but you know that it's yours if you have the courage to not doubt in your heart, but speak to it. I'm going to speak to some sickness. I'm going to speak to some relationships. I'm going to speak to some money. I'm going to speak to some opportunities. What is God telling you to speak to this Sunday morning? Because if it's your mountain, it's going to move if you open your mouth and start declaring that this mountain is mine. Say it's mine. Jesus said, your mountain knows your voice. What is your mountain? And the greatest tragedy you could do is get to the place where you start shutting up because your mountain doesn't move because you're thinking. Your mountain doesn't move because you're crying. Your mountain doesn't move because you're going to therapy. Your mountain moves when you open your mouth. And here's the thing about mountains. The mountain was created before you. Paul says it like this. For... God has those things for those that love him. I have not seen, ears not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for them. That means it's already done, prepared for them that love him. And I'm going to move through this part quickly, but Ephesians 1.11 says that everything God has for us is predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. It's, it's an inheritance that is predestined. Yeah. So everything that God has for you, he created before your mother and your father ever hooked up. It's up to us to find it. God says it is your inheritance. I've sat with families that were fighting over inheritances. And sometimes it's big inheritance. I've seen families split up over a $5,000 inheritance once. I said, really? Y'all are going to split up over a $5,000? thousand dollar inheritance but people fight over earthly inheritances not realizing that if you had a glimpse of your heavenly inheritance you would realize you don't need anything somebody leaves you God has everything you need ready for you say I'm finding my mountain The Bible is full of mountains. And I really didn't realize how many mountains were in the Bible until I started preparing this message. But each mountain gives us a glimpse of something that God has for us and our mountains. And the first mountain that I saw in the Bible was the mountain that Noah landed on. And this this mountain represents shifts. 40 days of seeing your old world drowned out. 40 days of living in trauma. Can you imagine the trauma that Noah's family went through? All of his kids' classmates were killed. Everybody Noah grew up with, killed. Everybody that missed Noah would hang out with, get her nails done with, get her hair done with. (laughs) Killed. Everybody in their world except their family drowned in the flood. Can you imagine how traumatizing that would be? 
to have to listen as the boat began to lift to everybody you loved, scream and bang on the boat. This is why God had to shut the door, because if God didn't shut the door and seal it, Noah and his family would have opened it. But it lets me know that when you get serious about God, you can't be concerned about what God does in the world. You got to be concerned about your family being spared from the world. I'm not saying we don't have a responsibility to be our brother and our sister's keepers. Yes, we are God's children. But at the end of the day, the Bible says Noah built this boat for the saving of his family. Amen. Everything I do for God is for the people that I love. Yeah. Amen. But this boat represents a shift. We're going from the old world to the new world. We're going from a storm and a flood to green grass and butterflies. We see here that when you find your mountain, you find your shift. Your whole life changes when you find your mountain. The first 30 years of your life could have been so horrible. The first 50 years of your life, so painful. But you find that mountain. And life begins to come alive again. We find shifts take place on mountains. The next mountain that I see is, is when uh, a, a man by the name of Abraham would take his only son Isaac up to the top, ready to kill him. And it was on this mountain that Abraham found security for his life. Your mountain brings security. You don't need to worry when you find your mountain. Because everything you need that God has for you is tied to your mountain. So if I find my mountain, it doesn't matter how bad life gets. I can always stay, step back and say, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to work together for my good. This too shall pass. Though the storm comes and the fires rage, I will come out okay. Because I found my mountain and in my mountain I have security. It was on Mount Moriah that God told Abraham, he said, you know, I see that you love me so much you won't hold nothing back from me. This is why I taught on tithing last week, because until God sees that you will give him what he asked for, he can't trust you with the security that comes with a mountain. Because you love what he's asking for more than you trust him. So it's security, and God said, because you did this, and you did not withhold your son. I guarantee you, if you asked Abraham, would you rather give your son or a tithe? What do you think he would choose? We wrestle with a tenth. Abraham was willing to lay down his child, his only child. He was acting like God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whenever God finds a sacrificer, he sees a mirror of himself. He said, because you didn't withhold your son. If you'll give me your son, I can ask you for anything. He says, in blessings, I'm going to bless you. See the security? You don't have to tell people you're blessed and highly favored. God says, in blessings, I'll bless you. In multiplying. I'll multiply. God says the reason it was worth the wait is because I don't do addition. God's a multiplier. So when I start moving, things start happening quickly. And you may be 50 and feel like you're behind. But God says when I start multiplying the next 30, 40 years of your life, God says are going to be so good because when I start multiplying, I get you to where you're supposed to be, not only on time, but I do exceeding and abundantly above all you ask or think. He says, I'm a multiplier. He says, as I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand upon the seashore. 
And your seed will possess the gates of his enemies. He will be a winner. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you obeyed my voice, because you went after a mountain. And Abraham didn't name God Jehovah Jireh. We always say he's Jehovah Jireh. Abraham didn't name God Jehovah Jireh. He named the mountain Jehovah Jireh. And he called Mount Moriah, and he, he called the name, not of God, of the place. See, my mountain is Jehovah Jireh. When I find my mountain, I see the God that multiplies. When I find my mountain, I, I see the God that fights my enemies. It, when I find my mountain, I see the God that, 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 that stretches my seed. When I find the mountain. And here's the thing about the mountain. When God told Abraham to go to the mountain to sacrifice his son, he didn't tell him the name of the mountain. He just said, start walking. And when Abraham was three days from the mountain, he saw it. I say that to say, you may not know what your mountain is going to look like. But when God sees that you're willing to be obedient and go after it, God says you will know your mountain when you see it. It's only a matter of time before you look up and see the mountain that you've been waiting for, the mountain that you've been praying for, the mountain that you've been fasting for, the mountain that you've been living right for. God says if you just keep walking, you're going to know it when you see it. So I may not know what it looks like right now, but I do know that this this is not my mountain. You are not my mountain. I do know what my mountain doesn't look like in this season. And I refuse to settle for a hill when God has called me to possess a mountain. Say, I got a mountain. In the mountain, you find security. In the mountain, what else do we find? In the mountain. As we bring up the next point, you find sharpening, sharpening, then structure. The sharpening takes place because when Moses went up on the mountain to find God, it was at that place that God began to say things in Exodus 4, like throw your rod down. And the rod became a a, a snake, and then he picked it back up. And, and God said, Moses, put your hand in your bosom. And, and his hand became leprous, white as snow. And God was showing Moses that uh, I'm not just a God that, 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 that can make you sick. I'm a God that can take sickness from you. He's showing Moses with the rod. I, I'm not just the God of the dead rod. I, I'm the God of resurrection. See, God has a way of getting you ready for your purpose while nobody knows who you are. He, he is sharpening you. And a lot of times people quit in the sharpening phase. Because Moses was 80 years old when God began to sharpen him. Are you in the sharpening phase? Because when you find your mountain, God begins to sharpen you for greatness. The mountain also provides structure. For it was on Mount Sinai that Moses was given the law and the diagram for the tabernacle. Your mountain begins to show you how to structure your life. Whenever I find a person whose life is all over here, they're dating this person, then they're dating that person, they're living with him, then they're living with her, they're taking this job, they're taking that job, they went to this church, they went to that church. What I see is I see a person who has no structure in their life. This stage I'm standing on is only able to hold me because the structure is solid. If the structure was not solid, wherever I stepped that the structure was weak, I'd fall through. God says, if you don't have a strong structure, you're going to constantly fall in life. Your mountain shows you your structure. Your mountain shows you who you need, who you got to let go of. Your, your, your mountain shows you how you have to dress. Your mountain shows you how you have to prepare. Your mountain gives your life structure. Your mountain gives your life sight. I remember when I went to Mount Nebo when I was in Jordan, and I stood at the exact place where Moses would have looked out at the promised land. 
And you can literally see all of the promised land from Mount Nebo. You can see Jerusalem. You can see as far as the Mediterranean Sea on the other side of Israel. Moses was able to see all of the promise that God had for his people. Your mountain gives your life vision. There's nothing more powerful than vision. I was telling a few of the people that are going to be getting ordained soon here and speaking throughout the summer, I said, when you get done speaking, it's going to change your life because you cannot step onto a new mountain and not have your whole perspective and perception of life shift. Because every mountain gives you a stronger vision. And the higher the mountain, the further you can, sp the further you can see. The mountain gives sight. The mountain gives trust. When Moses was on the mountain and he had his hands up, Israel had victory. When he put his hands down, Israel lost. So Aaron and Hor held his hands up. And whenever Moses' hands were up, Israel won. When he dropped his hands, Israel lost. And what does worship do? Worship shows that you trust God. Every time I stepped onto a new mountain, my trust in God has grown. So mountains give trust. Mountains give, and I'm going to breeze through these, mountains also bring transition. It was on Mount Gibeon that Saul had been killed, and David's kingdom would now start. Mountains give transition. Mountains give tenacity and toughness. This is where Elijah slayed the 850 prophets, 850 to 1 odds, and he won. Why? Because you cannot get onto a mountain and not be tenacious and tough. Mountains give transformation. Jesus looked at Peter, James, and John and said, climb with me. And he left the nine in the valley and went up with the three. And he was transfigured before them. So when you step onto a mountain, number one, understand, everybody cannot go onto your mountain with you. But number two, the you that went up will not be the same you that comes down. So when people say, you're, you're just so different, say, that's a good thing. <laughs> you should say that I'm different. In every season of my life, you should say, you sh I shouldn't be 40, and you say, man, you're just like you were at 18. <laughs> so it brings transformation. And lastly, mountains bring targeting. Jesus' destiny was fulfilled on a mountain. On Mount Golgotha, the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There's targeting. Jesus found joy while he was heading to his cross. Why? Because what you see is tragic. I see is triumphant. It's my destiny. If you saw the road I had to take to my destiny, you would say it was tragic or traumatizing. But for me, it was joyful because I was targeting towards something. So the mountain gives you a target to aim at. I just want you to see why you got to find your mountain. When... We get to the story today with the Hebrew people. We are going to see a man that wanted his mountain, but let's talk about the backstory. When we get to the book of Joshua, Moses has died. Now, Moses was a big deal to the Hebrew people, to the Israelites. He was their only revelation of God in a lot of ways. He, he was the first preacher that they knew. It was Moses that God used to bring them deliverance. It was Moses that God used to pull them out of Egypt to, to, to bring down Pharaoh. It was Moses 
that God used to bring down manna in heaven. It was Moses who, when God wanted to kill them and wipe them out, Moses interceded for them. It was Moses that brought the diagram of the tabernacle and the Ten Commandments down from the mountain. Moses turned the bitter waters into sweet waters. It was Moses, and Moses is gone. And you cannot replace somebody who's great. How many have ever lost somebody and it stings so bad because you know you'll never have another them? It hurt. And all of Israel was mourning for Moses for, for over a month. They couldn't move. They were stuck. And Joshua, his successor, was stuck with them. And so God had to come down and say something. Because you can't stay in grieving too long. I tell people that have lost, I say, you got to get over it quickly. And I don't say it to be mean. But understand this, the older you get especially, death is not slowing down. Death is going to start picking up. And if you don't do what you got to do to grieve the right way now, the next thing is going to destroy you. Because there will be a next thing. This will not be the last person that you see in hospice in your life. This will not be the last, if you have all your parents or both your parents, this will not be the last one if it's the only one that has passed. The other one's going to happen too. That's life. And so you have to quickly move on even if it hurts because life is going to keep coming at you because as you walk with God, the conditions are going to constantly change. So you have to pick yourself up. And God had to step in. I know what it's like to be down so long. I was down so long. I was down about a year, still doing the things of God. And then finally, my spiritual father had to call me and say, Tig, it's time to get up. <laughs> because every now and then you need a reminder or somebody to tell you enough is enough. You've been down about this for too long. You've been down about this breakup. You've been down about this death. You've been down about this lost opportunity for too long. God is calling you onto something bigger. God is calling you onto something stronger. God still has life in store for you. God still has promises in store for you. God still has some blessings that he wants you to go after. God has some giants that he wants you to slay. Some land that he wants you to step into but you're never going to step into it Joshua if you keep staying down over Moses at some point you have to make a decision Joshua should you have died with him because if God has you here it's because God still has life for you and though Moses is gone Joshua he put so much of himself in you that you owe Moses to get up and represent him well for everybody that's grieving him. Moses, my servant, is dead now. Therefore, arise. He's calling it out and he's telling Joshua, now. This is your now season. You've been waiting for a word. The word has come. Now. You've been asking God for a sign. The sign is here today. Now. You've been asking God if it's time. God is saying now. You've been asking God if you should do it. And God is saying now. You've been asking God, when is the healing going to come? And God is saying, now. You've been saying, Lord, when should I start working on the marriage? God is saying, now. You've been saying, God, when should I start getting ready to be married? God is saying, 
now. You've been saying, God, when should I go back to school? God is saying, now. You've been saying, God, when should I start the business? God is saying, now. This is your now season. God is saying, if I can get you to get up, if I can get you to wipe the tears off your eyes, off your cheeks, and walk in your now, I have some stuff, Joshua, that I want you to step into. I've got some relationships, some opportunities, some, some promises that if you can just get up and take a step, this is your now moment. Say, I'm stepping in now. Say goodbye to yesterday. Goodbye yesterday. Joshua, now get up and go over this Jordan. This is a get over it season for you, Joshua. You and all the people you need and all the people that are with you. See, when God can get you to step into a promise, don't be shocked if your faithfulness causes everybody that's connected to you to step over to. All it takes is one person to be in a get over this season. If everybody's going to sit down and cry, then everybody's going to be stuck. And I've learned that sometimes faith is not giving the offering. Sometimes faith is, is not quitting the job and, and, and moving to another state or moving to another country. Sometimes the greatest act of faith a person can make is just to have a, I'm getting over this mentality. And so they step into the promise and they give victory after victory after victory after victory. But you must understand, this is not where the promise for Joshua was started. Joshua saw this promise when he was much younger. By the time we get to this text, Joshua is around 80 years old. He's the same age his leader was when God started strengthening and structuring Moses. Moses was 80 on the backside of the desert when God started sharpening him. And now Joshua is 80 and stepping into his purpose too. And I said this started so long ago. This actually, this, this story started 40 years prior when Moses sent spies into the promised land. God told Moses to get one leader from every tribe and send them into the promised land. And Moses said, I want you to get up this way southward and go up, here it is, to the mountain. Say the mountain. I want all 12 of you to get up and go up into the mountain. Say the mountain. And here's what I want you all to do. I want you to see the land. I just want you to see it. I want you to spy it out. See, whenever God gives you a promise, it's up to you to spy it out first. I spy it out all the time. I drive into communities that I can't afford right now. I'm just spying it out. I walk into car dealerships I have no business being in. You know what I'm doing? Just spying it out. I, I, I read books that I have no business reading in this season of my life, but you know what I'm doing? I'm just spying it out. What are you spying out in this season? You know what God has for you by what you're spying out. God says, I want you to see it, because if I can get you to see it, I'll get you to reach for it. If I can get you to see it, the wilderness won't kill you because you'll have something to live for. 
You know why some people live and they're strong and, and you see others, they, they get old and don't leave the house and, and they're, they're scared to go to the grocery store and all that kind of stuff. And then you see some people the same age, they're getting on airplanes, they're going places, you know, they're, they're running for office. I mean, they're, they're just as old, you know. No pun intended, that was not <laughs> practice, that was, I have nothing negative to say. I'm just saying, I give people props for, for t stepping into their purpose. And when people tell them, you need to slow down, they have enough fight to say, this is my mountain. You're going to have to pry it away from me. Because this is mine. See, when you have something to live for, you have something to get out of bed every day for. I want you to see it because if I can get them to see it, the wilderness won't make them quit. So he says, I want them to see it. I, and Moses says, I want them to see if the people in the land are strong or weak, few many. I want them to see that the land that, that they dwell in, I, I want them to know is, is this land good or bad? I want to know what kind of cities they have. Are they in tents? Are they in strongholds? I, I want to know what the land is, whether it be fat or lean. And, 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 and I want to know if there's wood therein or not. He said, but be of good courage and, and bring the fruit of the lamb, for it is the season of the first stripe grapes. He says, I don't just want you to go. I want you to bring back to me the possibilities of it. What are the possibilities that could come with your life if you found your mountain? Jesus said it like this, count the cost. Moses said, I don't just want the good, I want the bad. What's the best that could happen? This is how I make every decision. What's the best that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? Does the best that could happen outweigh the worst that could happen? If the worst that could happen steps on the best that could happen, maybe this isn't my time to do it. But I, I need accurate information to make an accurate call. And they go. And they come back. And here's the tragedy. They come back. And they said, Moses, the land is surely flowing with milk and honey. And, and we brought back the grapes. Look at the grapes in the land. They are so juicy. They are so big. They are so ripe. Oh, but Moses, the milk and the honey, man. Whew. But nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land. Cities are walled like Jericho. Very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. We don't mess with the children of Anak. And look at their report. They're so, they saw how good it was. But they expected to get a promise without a fight. And it was young Caleb that spoke up. Caleb's main name means uh, bold. It says, and Caleb stilled the people. He, he basically said, shut up. Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are able to overcome it. See, this is what it looks like when you have real faith in God. You say, Lord, if you gave it to me, I don't care how scary it is. I don't care how intimidating it is. I don't care if it's like a Goliath laughing at me and telling me how stupid I am and how little I am. God, if you showed it to me, I can overcome any vink that is coming at me. He said, we need to go after this. We can overcome it. What God has for us is for us. Caleb says, I am willing to 
fight for it. I want it more than anything. How bad do you want what God has for you? Do you have the mentality that says, I will overcome it and I will go after it? Or are you the type of person that looks at the problem and lives in defeat? See, the problem with them is they were looking at the present storm and not looking at God's track record. And if you look at what's in front of you, you'll back down every time. But if you look at what's behind you and how God took care of you in the wilderness and how God brought you out of Egypt and how God turned your bitter seasons sweet and made provision come down from heaven, you'll look at every problem that comes at you and say, if God is for me, who can be against me? I've seen his track record. I've seen him provide. I've seen him heal. I've seen him restore store relationships. I've seen him bring prodigal children back home. I've seen God's track record. So this too will be like the lion and the bear behind me. This Goliath will fall. These walls of Jericho will fall. This, 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 this sea will split. If God did it before, God will do it again. How many overcomers came to church this morning that can look back over your life and see God's faithfulness. See how he healed that last heartbreak. See how he got you through that molestation. See how he got you a new job when you lost the old job. See how he kept you through a pandemic where others were falling apart. God kept you and preserved you. You shouldn't be alive today. Car accidents should have taken you out. Sicknesses should have taken you out. You should have had a disease, but God kept you. If God kept you through all of that, this is not going to be the end of your story. Say, I'm just getting started. Caleb says, we can overcome it. But the men said, we are not able to go against the people. For they are stronger than us. They are stronger than us. And in verse 33, he says, they see us as grasshoppers. You have to have a pretty low view of yourself to compare yourself to a grasshopper. Because if you had real faith, you would say, they may see me as a grasshopper, but this grasshopper is about to take their land from them. <laughs> so Moses said to Joshua, who also believed with Caleb, I'm going to trust the majority. It's not the time yet. I'm going to trust the 10. It's not the time yet. And he looked at Caleb and said, Caleb, because you have a different spirit inside of you. You went against the people. He says this in Numbers 14. You went against the people. You had a different kind of spirit in you. You had a, a, a God spirit in you. And you trusted in everything I did. In the past, Caleb, the land you stepped on will be yours. Because here's the thing. Most people, I've been pastoring for a little while now. Most people, if they were like Caleb and saw the possibilities, and yes, they have great faith in God. Most people I meet nowadays would not listen to Moses. This would be the pastor cannot talk to you. The spirit is leading me conversation. The spirit is leading me to my promise. And it takes a special kind of person to really feel like God is in something, but submit to the authority in your life. Because the Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And Caleb is 40 years old. He's strong. And most of us would say, this is the Lord. I saw the grapes. I saw the potential. I saw the opportunity. This is the Lord. 
And, and later there would be a bunch of them that would say it is the Lord. And you know what would happen to everybody that said it was the Lord before Moses said it was time? They got killed. But because Joshua and Caleb submitted, God said, you too will be the only ones of this generation, the only ones that grew up in Egypt that get to see the promise. So 40 years would blow by. I saw an article recently that Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence were getting back together to do a new movie. And they haven't done a movie since Life. And Life is one of my favorite movies. I remember being a teenager and sitting in the back of the theater watching Life. <laughs> and one of the scenes that always jumped out to me is towards the end when it shows them all kind of young and, and it starts to fade and you start to see them all aging and disappearing. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening in the story now. We are fast forwarding 40, 45 years and that whole generation is fading away. The generation that did not have faith, the generation that did not know how to submit, they are all fading away. The generation that complained and murmured, they are all fading away. And it's just Joshua and Caleb and they step into the promised land. And they are conquering city after city after city. And then when we get to Joshua 14, Joshua is now distributing the land. He's giving out property to everybody. And it says that at 85, Caleb comes up. He's 85 years old. Still, still moving forward. 85 years old. And he says, Joshua, you know the thing Moses, the man of God, said concerning me. Let me throw that. He's a man of God. Let me just remind you who said this to me. You know what he said to me. He said it 45 years ago. You know what he said. See, what we're going to see about God is when God gives you a promise, He'll also keep you around to experience it. You, you know what he said to me. What did he say to you? He said, 40 years old I was when Moses sent me, you know, from Kadesh Barnea to espy the land. I, I was young, I was strong, and he sent me to spy out the land. And I, I brought him word again as it was in my heart, man. It was in my heart. I believed what I said. When I said we could possess it, I meant it. I wasn't talking. I wasn't playing. It was in my heart. And remember what Jesus said. If you believe something in your heart, it's yours. I believe it. It's mine. What's in your heart that is concrete? What's in your heart that you know belongs to you? I've met elderly people with no promise, and I've met elderly people with great promises. I've met people that are 89 years old, or I met a person that was 89 years old a few weeks ago, and, and strong as can be, and he's talking about an event that he's doing in 2030. Rent at the venue put out the money already it's in 2030 he will be 94 or 95 years old in 2030 but here's the thing if he's not planning for 2030 he won't see 2030 what is in your heart that defies where you are He says, Moses promised me that this would be mine. And I submitted, and I didn't do the whole the Lord's leading me thing. I listened to Moses. I respected my leader. 
And now it's pay up time. Look at what he goes on to say in verse 8. He says, nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made heart of the people. Now, it only takes a few people to make a majority get in fear, fear mode. That's why you got to get rid of all the people that speak to your fear in your life. It only takes a handful to make a nation turn. He said, the, the majority listened to the people, but, but I, I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore to me, saying, surely the land whereupon your, your feet have trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you wholly, you didn't follow your desire you followed the Lord your God. And following the Lord my God meant submitting to Moses. Even when my desire was telling me something different. He said, Moses, promise me, what land did you step on? Remember, he said, I want you to go over that what? Mountain. He says, that mountain I stepped on? That's mine. He said, and he kept me alive 45 years. I'm 85. He said, he kept me alive. See, God can keep you alive if you give your life to him and go after a mountain. He kept me alive. He kept me alive when cancer tried to get me. He kept me alive when suicide tried to get me. He kept me alive when addiction was trying to get me. How many can look back over your life and it's very clear. You may not be 85, but it has clearly been the Lord that has kept you uh, alive. You should have been dead. You should have been killed. You, you, everything should have been over, but it's clear it was the Lord that kept you alive. He says, and he kept me alive. And he says, these 40 years since he spoke through the servant of Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the desert. And lo, now I'm here 45 years later. As, and here is, as yet, I, I am as strong this day as I was in that of Moses. I mean, he says, not only did God keep me alive, God kept me strong. I don't want to be alive and not strong. I, I don't want to, you know, be alive, but I can't live. I don't want to be alive and stuck in a place that even my kids don't come see me. Till the day they put dirt on my casket. I want to be alive and strong. I want to be as strong at 80 as I am right now at 40. And, and Caleb is saying, God not only kept me alive, God has kept me strong. I still feel like I felt when he first spoke the promise to me. Why did God keep me as strong as I was then? Because God did not want me to have to wait and step into my purpose with a weak body. I am as strong this day as, as, oh, as I've ever been. He says, oh, tell me, tell me to go out to war. I, I'm not too old to go to war. I meet people that say they're too old to serve in the parking lot. And I know they're not mountain climbers. He says, I'm 85, but put me on the front line. I'll fight in war. He says, I, I know how both to come out and come in. He says, don't treat me like an old man. Don't talk to me like I'm an old man. He says, I'm still stronger than most of these people here. And with that being said, Joshua... And you got to understand, Joshua is a type of Christ. Yahshua, he's a type of Christ. His name means God is a deliverer. So Caleb is a lot like us talking to Jesus. So when you look at this conversation, 
It's also allowing you to see how you can pray. He says, now that I'm telling you I'm alive, and now that I'm telling you I'm strong, and now that I'm telling you I'll fight somebody in war, I'll come out, I'll go in, I'm not willing to be treated any less than anybody else here. He goes on to say this, and this is where we start to bring it home. He says, Joshua, give me my mountain. And that's what I want somebody to say before you leave this service. Lord, I've waited. Lord, I've been patient. Lord, I've been trusting. Lord, I've been praying. Lord, I've been submissive. But in this season, I want my mountain. Give me my mountain. I don't know what your mountain is, but say, give me my mountain. I don't know how big it looks, but say, give me my mountain. I don't know how many people have failed trying to climb it before, but say, give me my mountain. The air may get tight at the top, but say, give me my mountain. The climate may change, but say, give me my mountain. The conditions may be unpredictable, but say, give me my mountain. I don't know if your mountain is healing, your mountain is love, your mountain is opportunity, your mountain may be your family, your mountain may be a promise, but whatever it is, I want you to say, give me my mountain. mountain. Caleb says, I've been doing this for 80 five years. I am strong. I am alive. I am fit for battle. And I want my mountain. Say, give me my mountain. Put it in the chat room. Give me my mountain. Caleb says, Lord, give me my mountains. Oh, oh, oh. And the Lord spoke in the day when you heard how the, the Anakins were there and the cities were our great friends. Remember the people said, oh, we can't, we can't fight the, the Anakins. He says, if the Lord will be with me all by myself. The nation was scared of these people. But because this threat is on my mountain. See, I want to know today what's on your mountain. Who has your mountain? Who's taking care of your mountain right now? He says, if the Lord will be with me, I'm old, but I've never forgotten this. I need Jesus in my life. I'm old, but I've never forgotten this. If the Lord is with me, I can do the impossible. Who is it that said it like this? Paul, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He says, if the Lord is with me, I can defy the odds. If the Lord is with me, this old man will get some victory. If the Lord is with me, the enemy cannot stay in my life for much longer. He says, all I need is my promise and my God, and I can defy the odds. God is saying, this Sunday, it's time to drive some stuff out of your life, out of your promise, out of your mountain. But it is going to require you in him. Not you by yourself. You and God. Caleb, are you still strong? Caleb, are you still alive? Caleb, can God still call you to war? Caleb, can you go out and come in like you used to? God has kept you strong. God has kept you sharp. For the mountain that he has for your life. It was Caleb's boldness and Joshua's position that came together and shook up the enemy. It is going to be Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Most people get caught up on the Christ and we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. But but don't minimize your part in the scripture without an I can Christ can do nothing Caleb had the I can Joshua had the strength and when the two came together the enemy had to flee from what belonged to Caleb God is saying to somebody today if me and you 
can come together. The enemy can get off the mountain of your home. The enemy can get off the mountain of your marriage. The enemy can get off the mountain of your singleness. The enemy can get off the mountain of your healing. The enemy can get off the mountain of your money. If we can come together, this is why I need God in everything in my life. Because I need to know at all seasons that he's my partner. If he's my partner, I don't have to worry about sickness. If he's my partner and I'm wholly following him, I don't have to worry about money. If he's my partner, I don't have to worry about people. Is God your partner? Because if he's your partner, then he's saying to you today, this is the season for us to find your mountain. Because your mountain, when you find it, your mountain knows your voice. It's not going to take a lot for your life to change when you find your mountain. It's going to respond when you just open your mouth. Are you ready to find your mountain?